and jujitsu just god damn it does it does it not apply to your whole life you know one of the things that i tell people all the time is you know one of one of my key things that i tell veterans that i'm trying to get to train jujitsu is jujitsu really it teaches you that there's a solution to every single problem every submission there's an escape you know and sometimes there's a point where you gotta tap and that goes to you know your mental health you know you can take so much take so much take so much but sometimes you gotta fucking tap you gotta ask your instructor for help you know go see a psychiatrist go see a doctor go see somebody talk to me you know there's there's so many people out there that you can reach out to but like i said the the correlation between jujitsu and everyday life is there is a solution to every single problem you know there's an escape there's a sweep or something. We're not out here fighting for our life, and that I think is the confusion that sometimes, when, whether people's doing, they're doing jujitsu or they're trying to struggle with their life and they don't want to tap, they don't want to ask for that help. And at the end of the day, you know, the majority of the time we get to. So why wouldn't you? All right. So that was the trailer to the PTSD versus Jiu-Jitsu documentary that we're going to be filming. Um, so don't judge my video editing skills. I thought it was pretty good. Um, so if you guys want to check out the dates for the tour and everything like that, they're actually in the description for this podcast right now. Um, if you go to the GoFundMe, every single tour date is there. All the tour dates are going to be open. Um, they're open seminars. So you guys can come to an open mat. You can come learn some Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about PTSD and Jiu-Jitsu and how how it helps and how it's been super helpful for not only law enforcement, but veterans, you know, rape survivors, any, any person who's been through any sort of, you know, extreme trauma, jujitsu can be extremely helpful. So my goal on this documentary tour is to tell this story, tell the story about how jujitsu is an extremely effective tool against PTSD of any kind. Um, also, I just want to say today is brought to you by our official sponsor, uh, today is the first day I'm actually releasing the name of our CBD sponsor. It's called The Baked Shop Treats. It's a veteran-owned CBD company. There's no psychoactive stuff in there, so there's no THC or anything, so it's 100% legal. Um, so these guys, they gave me a, a supply of CBD, and I've been taking it for about a month and a half, two months now. And they gave me a specific type because I still struggle with some anxiety issues, and it's been absolutely amazing. I've been sleeping better. I've been feeling better, you know. I'm always going to have some sort of issues here and there, but it's been making it a lot better. Um, they got all kinds of stuff. If you guys want to check them out, go to Instagram, the baked shop treats, their website will be out March 1st. So they'll be able to, you'll be able to go there and order whatever you need from there. So, uh, go check them out on the baked shop treats on Instagram. And as well, uh, we're also brought to you by, uh, TKL knives. If you go to TKL knives, you want a nice, uh, knife made by a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he used promo code warrior. Uh, you'll get 10% off and the, he donates that 10% to the nonprofit. Also, uh, Buffalo Custom Engraving, they make uh, really cool tumblers and water bottles for Warriors Next Adventure. Go to the webpage, go to the Warriors Next Adventure tab, and uh, they donate a portion of the proceeds to the nonprofit. Okay, so today my guest, um, as soon the second I saw his story, I'm like, I got to have this guy on the podcast because we got to talk. So um, double amputee, lost his legs in Afghanistan, um, and became the first double amputee police officer in the United States. So that's one hell of a feat. Um, this guy trains jujitsu. Um, that's a big reason why I wanted to have him on, especially because we're doing the jujitsu tour here soon. Um, jujitsu is such an amazing tool for recovery. Um, and I also want to talk to him and see how, you know, being a double amputee, you know, works with his game. You know, I'm sure he's still triangling the shit out of people. I've seen his thighs, dude's leg pressing like a thousand pounds still with uh, fucking with uh, prosthetic legs and shit. So I'm going to bring him on here and uh, let him tell his story. What's up, man? Thanks for coming on. Hey, what's up, brother? How are you doing? Good. Okay. So, dude, you're seriously, um, I, I've been seeing your posts or like I've been seeing people talk about your story for the last like month and a half, two months now. Um, when were you sworn in as a police officer? So I got into the police department in September of 2016. So I'm coming around uh, four years, five years in September. Man, it's it's weird how it's just now starting to get out. Like I'm sure stuff was out before, but for some reason you just exploded recently, and everybody's been talking about you. Why do you think that is? Um, I recently created a new uh, Instagram page, which was kind of um, in the back of my mind in the beginning when I first got into the police department, and um, and I I've kept you know my page private just for you know police reasons and uh, privacy reasons for my family and whatnot. 
And uh, I decided to make a public account maybe about a month ago um, to start showing and and kind of platforming the things that I do for other veterans, other people that are going through disabilities, uh, life changing events. And um, I felt like I was doing a disservice to people who were in my shoes about 10 years ago uh, when I was constantly looking up first double amputee this or that or the other, whether it was adapted sports or whatever. Um, so I thought that I was doing this service. So I just recently started that Instagram page, which is basically my first name uh, and my last name. And people were like, oh, my God, this is crazy that you're doing this. And how do you do that? And I'm just getting so much feedback. And there's been, you know, some negativity along with it, um, as you can imagine. But um, sure. in today's world, I think that uh, being behind a computer kind of sets you to say certain things that you wouldn't say something like that uh, years ago. But um, again, I'm just kind of trying to put out some motivation, some positivity out there in the world. And I think that uh, people uh, are to get credit, though. Yeah. But, you know, again, like oh, anything, uh, you get used to it. My bad. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. Dude, you, anytime you, you stick your neck out there, you're opening yourself up for criticism. So, like, when I started WNA, I'm like, I know I'm going to get fucked with by, especially veterans. Veterans <laughs> yeah. are the biggest judgmental group of people you can ever meet. Absolutely. It's crazy. Absolutely. It's like, anytime, you know, show me show me a more salty person than a veteran who's sitting here ragging on another veteran who's being successful. It's just, it's insane, dude. So, knock that shit off, guys. Um, but, no, so, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? And uh, what made you want to join the Marine Corps? So I grew up in a very small country in South America, uh, Uruguay. It's right under Brazil. And um, my mom's brother lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, and she told my brothers and I that uh, they wanted to go visit. And, you know, of course, they came to Atlanta, Georgia and uh, fell in love with the uh, the American dream, you know, to being able to achieve anything and go after anything and basically live a dream that most people can only imagine. And um and so they applied for student visas and work visas back in like 95, 96. And so we came up a couple months after them uh, to go visit my cousins who I'd never met, uh, my uncles who I'd never met and stuff like that because they lived in, in the United States and uh, they fell in love with it. So um, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia uh, during the uh, Centennial Olympics in 96. And, um, and my, I was walking around with my dad and I was holding his hand and I saw a guy in uniform and I thought he was a police officer. So I was like, dad, I want to be like him when I grow up and I want to be a police officer. And uh, my dad was like, he's not a police officer. He's a Marine. And I was like, what's a Marine? I was six years old, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and he just basically described it as somebody who took care of this country and fought for their freedoms, you know, home and away. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Just like your typical kid, you know, he sees a person yeah. in uniform, whether it's a cop or uh, a service member or a pilot or a lawyer, you know, we always want to be those big, uh, big jobs, big careers. And so now, you know, I'm living my life and just typical kid playing sports, you know, growing up, I had an older brother, younger brother. And, um, you know, then in 2001, not 11 happened. And, uh, I got in trouble. I remember getting in trouble because I laughed. I thought it was like some sick joke or a movie or a show of those towers collapsing and, uh, living in Atlanta, Georgia, it wasn't so impactful. Like it was for the, you know, your native New Yorkers who were dealing with it firsthand. So, you know, from that day on forward, when I found out and when I saw like the kids in my class crying because they had somebody in those buildings um, when those towers collapsed, I was like, man, I got to be in that. I got to be in that uniform and fighting the bad guys, like my dad said when I was younger. So I, I wrestled and I, I played sports, kept myself super busy. Um, career career day would come by and people were like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was like, I'm going to the Marines, so I don't really need to look into schools <laughs> or college or anything like that, you know. And uh, of course, I graduated high school in 2007 and um and uh, there was a, a waiting period to go into the Marine Corps because there's so many guys enlisting for the war. Um, so I was working at a restaurant, a very small Mexican restaurant and uh, traveling and doing what a typical, you know, 18, 19 year old does at right at high school. And uh, I remember I went to Panama City Beach with a bunch of friends and it's like 1158 at night, right before midnight. And my phone rings. I was in bed and uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Beck, I'll never forget his name, Staff Sergeant Beck, <laughs> Marine Corps recruiter. He's like, hey, man, you still want to go to Marine Corps boot camp? You know, can you still can you want to come earlier? And I said, yeah, but I'm not supposed to go till December 7th, which is Pearl Harbor. Day. That's the only reason I remembered it. And he's like, well, we just got a guy drop out. You know, you want to go? And I said, ah, hell yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. And I'm waking everybody up in our condo. I'm like, yo, I got to go. I got to go back to, to Georgia uh, to get ready to go to MEPS. And so uh, a couple what of my buddies agreed. To leave there after that? Was it like a day What's that? After? Uh, what, I was supposed what? to uh, like a day. Yeah, I had a day to basically <laughs> go back and do my PT test and all that stuff, uh, get it out of the way. So I'm doing the PT test at like 4.30 in the morning. 
um, basically to get ready for maps that morning at like seven thirty, eight o'clock and uh and do my my oath and my swearing and stuff you gotta love and, those uh, uh, underwear olympics at mix huh oh Bunch man <laughs> yeah. and crab walks in their undies <laughs> exactly exactly so uh you know so now i'm 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 going into the marine corps a lot quicker than i thought i was going but you know i was really prepared um or i thought i was at least uh to get out of there and go to boot camp um and you know i don't know what what kind of timeline you want i don't know if you want me to keep going telling that story or what yeah, so now I get to uh, I get to Paris Island, North Carolina or South Carolina, and uh, guy gets on the bus screaming, yelling, as you probably already know, and uh, and I'm like, what the hell did I sign up for? This is crazy. <laughs> I got some guy in my face, you know, and just like any typical kid, you know, at 18, 19 years old, I was like, who is this guy, and why, when is he gonna get out of my face, you know? So now the next couple months are just hell, you know, going through boot camp, and of course now we all look back and go, oh, that was nothing, but in the time, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And uh, so now I graduate in uh, in 2009, and uh, I was an infantry guy, so I was basic open infantry. And they told us that as soon as we get get off of a of a Paris Island, we'd go home for a week, and then we report to SOI, which is School of Infantry. And uh, and so now I get assigned to Charlie Company, which we call a Concentration Charlie, and uh, <laughs> we all basically do all of our O3 open infantry stuff. So basically, all your M4s and uh, log gunners and 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 the 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 missiles and whatnot and uh and they split us up into units you know 0331 machine gunner 0341 mortarman 0351 tow gunner and assault men and you know whatnot and uh, i signed up for 0331 machine gunner so now we go off into our own world and basically get to know the, the operating system the 240 bravo the mark 19 the modus you know the 50 cal and Man, uh I, I, was a, I was a heavy gunner too but i i was in the air force but um i was uh security forces so i got lucky i was actually one that got to do convoys and everything when i was in Iraq okay and, and oh my god i told people all the time if you shoot the 50k and you don't get an erection you're doing it wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was definitely like every kid's dream come true you know i mean oh of course god, they jammed up if you didn't have time and spacing down but uh yeah. you know what we, we got that down to a t uh so now you know of course like uh SOY is finishing up and they're assigning us to the battalions and uh, we all kind of wanted to go Hawaii because they were saying Hawaii needed Marines and I was like how cool would that be but <laughs> we ended horrible. up like uh, yeah exactly well <laughs> I talked to the Marines that were in Hawaii and they're like man get sold real quick just like anything else I guess uh, sure. but we end up in in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina I was assigned to 1st Battalion 8th Marines 2nd Marine Division which I heard just uh, recently uh, decomped and then made uh, 8th Marines 6th Marines now so my unit's not even around anymore but uh, we were told we were going to be deploying to Helmand Pranis Afghanistan in September of 2010. And, uh, of course, looking back and thinking back now, it's like crazy. You know, September 2001 happened, and I was like, I can't wait to be over there. And now September 2010, which is backwards in the day, is here, and I'm walking the streets of Afghanistan. Like, all right, be careful what you wish for, you know. Um, so now we get there, and they tell us we're going to Helmand and Muzakela and Sangin, and uh, and we're, you know, we're like, all right, let's go. You know, we're ready. And uh, – and we get there, and of course, you know, you're nervous, you're shaking in your boots, and you got all this gear, and you're getting off the helicopter into the, the what, new FOBs. What year were you in Afghanistan? Uh, I was there from September of 2010 to uh, 11, 2011, when I got up, when I got hurt. Okay, yeah, we were there 11, 12, up in, uh, okay. I was up in Bagram. Bagram, okay. Yeah, we went through Bagram Air Force Base. Um, but, you know, so now, get off the helicopter, and uh, we're all kind of shitting in our pants, you know, going, oh, my God, we're here. You know, we're, we're just waiting for the Taliban to start shooting at us. And uh, and the guys that we were leaving were laughing because, like, hey, man, nothing's happening in, like, two months. You know, but now getting in there in, in the heat, you know, is when the Taliban kind of come out and play. So, um, you know, not even 24 hours into our first day on the on the FOB, you know, the far, uh, forward operating base, we're starting to take small on fire and a uh, little stupid stuff like that. I guess the Taliban were just testing us out, see what we do, uh, being the new guys around the block. And yeah, um, they, they knew when rotations were coming in too. Like a lot of people don't understand the Taliban are very, oh, they're very smart. clever. They're smart. They're very shit. smart. Yeah. They've been they going through the war on the base. They'll start, they'll start shooting mortars left and right just to see how the new people react. You know, absolutely. They're, they're smart as shit. Absolutely. You know, so now we're there for a couple of months and guys are starting to get hit, you know, left and right. And, and then we're taking casualties. And uh, of course that's kind of like a, a rude awakening. Like, you know, shit, this just got real. And um, I remember my doc, uh, my Navy corpsman, Gonzo, uh, stepped on an IED and lost, you know, both legs, both arms and, and bled to death. And, you know, he was the, kind of our first casualty we took. And uh, we couldn't believe it. You know, the guy that was there to help us, to help people, to save us, 
uh, was the first one to go. And, and uh, you know, we, we obviously remember him till today and we'll never forget him. But it was How just kind of your deployment was that that was like our first, you know, that was October 8, 2010 that he got killed. So, yeah. you know, just about a month in. And uh, and now guys are starting to fall left and right, you know, and uh, and we're trying to reevaluate the situation to see what's going on. So we pushed to a different fob, you know, to do operations in that town. And um, and now I'll fast forward because basically every day was the same thing, just, you know, different day. And uh, January 21st, 2011, we were told that we were going to be picking up all of our stuff and doing a push, which for, you know, the people that aren't list that are listening that are not veterans. A push is basically when you pick all your stuff up, you have a new mission, you go into a new different place um, and you try to do some type of element of surprise. So you do it at nighttime, no vehicles, just on foot. So now we're walking several miles with LV packs, 50 cows taken apart, you know, so somebody's carrying the receiver, somebody's killing the barrel, somebody's carrying the tripod, um, you know, and you're looking at 55 pounds and just weapon systems and not even the, the ammunition, not your gear, the backpack, you're not M4, your pistol, you're a gunner. Um, you know, but now we do this this walk all the way across town and we finally get there and we have three different teams, the entry team, the overwatch team and the capture team. And I was part of the overwatch team being a machine gunner. So now, boom, the, the door gets kicked in, um, you know, like everybody sees in the movies and, you know, all, all of a sudden you start hearing clear, 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 clear. So now we pick up our stuff and we start going in the compound and uh, we lock the compound up and our captain tells us, hey, listen, we're going to stay put for the night. Tomorrow we'll start doing patrol and see what's going on and see what kind of intel we can get. So my team and I went up to the roof of this little compound, you know, this little mud hut house. And uh, and we start putting the tripods down. I told my guys, like, hey, we're going to do, you know, talking guns left, right, cover all the fields of fire. And, um, and you know, we'll stay kind of Vietnam style uh, fire watch. You know, one guy stays up one hour. The next guy stays up one hour. The next guy stays one until the next day. And so I tell the guys to stay put. I'm going to jump down and go get the rest of the gear. And when I jump down, um it was kind of like hollywood you know all of a sudden everything goes black i hear a pin drop you know it was crazy i, I honestly yeah. can't believe how down to the t they have it you know I, I hear that pin drop and i start hearing don't move look for, look for secondaries don't fucking move and i, I hear my I hear my corpsman like running up and i see these little white lights you know bouncing all over the place which is basically the little led lights everybody's got the hand lamps and um you know what they were doing is daisy chaining you know our our single berries to the the secondaries and you know, yep. one guy goes in to save you, and then the next guy gets blown up too. So um, all were of a sudden, I started. Secondaries, or did they? There did were they no clear? secondaries that there were no secondaries that evening. Um, I was the first person to get hurt, and uh, the guy behind me caught some shrapnel, you know, from the bomb. And then all of a sudden, I start hearing Bravo, Mike, Foxtrot, seven two two nine. And you know, they're clearing the LZ and uh, basically calling out the the nine line medevac. And uh, you know, I just remember my guys looking at me like, "Hey, man, you're gonna be all right." And I'm like, "What the hell's going on?" You know, I didn't feel the pain in the in the initial blast just because of the shock you know and um my my corpsman hit me with some morphine i was feeling pretty good and uh and then i start looking down and i see blood everywhere and i was like holy shit what happened you know like i'm looking at my hands and my hands are there you know and I'm, i just have blood all over me and i couldn't tell what happened um you know so now i hear the helicopter coming in they're putting me in the helicopter and the morphine started to finally kick in so the the two the two medics on board um from the drugs, I was probably hallucinating, but I thought I saw like aliens or some shit. And really, it was like <laughs> MVG lights, you know, from their night vision goggles reflecting off their face. And like, hey, marine, uh, they said, hey, soldier, you're gonna be, you're gonna be all right. And I remember just saying, I'm a fucking marine, I'm not a soldier, you know. And <laughs> uh, and then they just started laughing, they gave me a thumbs up, and I passed out, you know. Yeah. And uh, I wake up in Bagram uh, for a little bit, you know, until they they kind of stop the bleeding and uh, get me ready to get to launch to Germany to start emergency surgeries and whatnot. And it's in Germany is when I woke up and I, I felt like, uh, I felt like Lieutenant Dan, you know, I was wrapped up in ace bandages and shit. And I was like, man, what the hell happened? And you know, I'm trying to like, ice put, cream? yeah, I didn't get ice cream, man. I got shit out of luck on that. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the, everybody there was great. You know, everybody was like, Hey man, you're going to be okay. And I knew at that point I was going home. So I didn't really care. I just, I wanted to go home and I, and I wanted my, my Marines to come home with me. You know, I, I didn't want to wait for them. So uh, now 24 hours pass and they stabilized me in Germany. And I don't remember the name of the town that we were in, but the nurse came in and goes, hey, do you know where you're at? And uh, I'm like, typical Marine, I'm like looking to see where I can find where I'm at. And I see it on a blanket. It says launch duel. And I was like, yeah, long duel or something like that. And I said it like that. And she starts <laughs> laughing. She's like, yeah, launch duel. You're in launch duel, Germany. And I said, OK. I said, what's going on? And like, well, you're going to be going home. You're going home to start rehab and uh, you're going to be OK. And, and you're a hero. And. 
And I just remember saying, you know, I'm not a fucking hero, you know, and I'm just thinking like I'm worthless at the time because here I am. I'm out, of, I'm out of combat. I don't have my weapon on me anymore. Um, you know, so well, it's kind of a hard survivor's guilt kicks in really fast. A lot of people don't understand. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if you've never looked into what survivor's guilt is, even the guys who get severely injured, obviously, you know, but for the other people that don't, you know, survivor's guilt kicks in almost initially, especially if you leave your friends behind. If you're injured in war and you have to leave, the first thing you start thinking about is you're, I'm a bag of shit because my guys are still overseas and I'm sitting here at fucking long stool you know, waiting for, you know, waiting to go home. So, I mean, it's the psychological effects of, um, of survivor's guilt can, you know, kick your ass much more than PTSD even can. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. The way yeah in the beginning, it's, it's rough, you know, it's rough. You want to be there for your brothers, you know, and you can't. Yeah. So, um, you know, you do the best you can mentally in the moment and, uh, and, you know, nothing really can prepare you for that, but you know, that's going to be all right, you know, and, uh, I'd like to consider myself a pretty religious person, you know, and I believe in God and I knew that he had a plan and, you know, everything was going to be okay, which, you know, obviously we'll probably get into that later. But, um, you know, and at that point we're going to Washington DC to the Bethesda or Walter Reed at the time. And then we transitioned to Bethesda, but, you know, we get there and it was crazy. It felt like I was in a movie when, you know, you're in, they pick up the caskets with the, with the flags draped over them, you know, except I was alive. You know, I remember the, the Marines coming on board and saying, Hey Marine, you're home. And, they were all Marines because they didn't fuck that up, you know? Um, <laughs> but there were, it, it was like a surreal feeling because you got three Marines on the left, three Marines on the right of the bedside and they, they have to pick it up and take you off the, the plane. And, um, and it was just Lieutenant colonels, Colonel staff sergeants, you know, picking these, these, these guys up. And I just remember looking to my, to my right. And I saw one of my snipers who got blown up too. And he just gave me a thumbs up and, you know, we kind of went through the process, um, you know, of going to the hospital and, I was greeted there with my mom and my dad. You know, they they got a call from from Atlanta, uh, saying that they were gonna fly them out to Germany because they didn't think I would make it. Um, so my parents were already ready to go to Germany, and they called them and said, "Hey, last minute plans. We're going to D.C. He's gonna be he's gonna be transported there." So you know, I get to Washington D.C. My family's there. I'm super happy to see them, and um, you know, I know I'm hurting at the time, but I was just trying to find ways to be positive, you know. And uh, and from there on, you know, I'm sure you got plenty of questions after that. Yeah, man, pretty fucking hard to stay positive with all that shit going on too. Well, what was the, what were the first few months like, man, when you were going through rehab and everything like that? Were you were you struggling with, uh, you know, obviously, I'm assuming you were diagnosed with PTSD. I wouldn't be surprised if you were. Um, what what was it like dealing with all that? Like, do you still struggle with, you know, a lot of the flashbacks and a lot of, you know, issues from war? Do you still struggle with that now? Like, what do you do to cope with that? I'm very fortunate, man. I um. I guess I got, I had a, I had a different upbringing, you know, I, I was always uh, finding something to be positive about, you know, coming from a very different, diverse culture, you know, in South America and, and having the family support that I did and having the, the religious background that I did, I was always trying to find some positivity. And I'm not going to say I never had my moments where I was upset about what happened. Um, you know, but at the same time, like I said, I always found something good in my life that was happening. So whether it was, you know, getting my prosthetics for the first time or, pissing standing up for the first time or you know <laughs> eating ice cream for the first time yeah, yeah. um i was always trying to find something that was good and uh and i've just learned so many different things to do in life um that have helped me throughout the years to get even better and better and hopefully reflect that that uh the attitude to other veterans that you know maybe you're looking at it a different perspective um but the first couple months you know i, I had a broken pelvis so um i couldn't really even stand for the first three months because i was non-weight bearing uh, so there was no prosthetics until month three or four. And um, and so once I got out of that wheelchair for the first time and I was able to stand upright for the first time, um, there was a mission, man. It was the mission to get back into walking and 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 push it to see what my limitations are going to be. Um, you know, so at first it sucks. It hurt. And there was a lot of pain and trying to get through that pain and trying to get, you know, my mind right to to do the things that I once was able to do was, was very difficult. Um, but they had this peer support group. Uh, that basically other veterans who had been in the same shoes as you would come into your room and talk to you. Uh, at the time, I didn't know about this little shit. He walked in my room. He's double amputee, but I didn't know at the time. Wearing pants and GBX heavy like construction boots and a T-shirt comes in. And it's like, hey, what's up, man? How are you? My name is blah, blah, blah. And uh, I just want to let you know you're going to be all right. And I'm looking at him like, who the fuck are you to tell me that I'm going to be all right? You know, walks in here like all peppy and, and smiling. 
And he's like, he's like, dude, I always forget, you know, I'm a double amputee. I'm a Marine. And I was like, you're a what? And he's like, I'm an amputee. And he's like, and I was like, fucking show me. You know, he pulls up his pant leg. You would have never been able to tell. The guy just walked right in. Great stride. You wouldn't have seen anything wrong with his gait. I mean, he'd been walking for a little bit and he's yeah. competing in some type of uh, uh, Paralympic stuff. So the guy was doing amazing things. So now I went from this like negative person to telling him to get out of my room to basically having a million questions for him. You know, like, can you drive? Can you go out and party? Can you do this? Can you do that? You know, and the guy was sitting there for like an hour um, answering questions. He's like, man, he's like, I live here. So whenever you need me, I'll come and, and talk to you. But I got to get out of here. And I said, all right. So that night I stayed up all night like on the computer, you know, like look at, yeah, looking up things of, of amputees because I didn't know what an amputee was. I never even met an amputee before I got hurt. Um, you know, so it was definitely interesting, you know, to say the least. So what, what was your, what was your mindset like? What, cause you know, it, it, the good thing is, you know, the VA does compensate when, when veterans come back from war and, you know, have amputees and everything like that, but, but you don't want to just sit there, you know? So what was your drive to want to be a police officer? Is that something you always wanted to do? Or is it kind of just like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to prove that, you know, this shit ain't going to slow me down. Or what was your mindset there? I had to find what every other veteran is looking for. You know, I had to find that camaraderie again. Um, I knew that going into the military, um, either I wanted to be a police officer or a fireman or uh, a Marine, you know, somebody in uniform, somebody who's going to help out people, help out the community, do something to serve uh, somebody else besides themselves. And so I knew that the police department was probably the closest thing to the military brotherhood um, and the job type, you know, uh, wearing the uniform, protecting the community and, and, you know, preserving life um, and property was going to be the closest thing to it. And so it wasn't for the first couple of years that I, I wanted to do it. I, I started playing on a very uh, popular team called the USA Patriots. We were once known as the Winter Warrior Amputee Softball Team. Um, it's an all veteran team, uh, of all amputees traveling the country, playing softball against able bodies teams. Um, oh, cool. and it was awesome. These guys are unbelievable collegial athletes. Like some of these guys played in college ball and, uh, were playing, you know, competitive ball for their entire life. So, um, it was kind of crazy that, uh, that, you know, I, I had an opportunity to be a part of this team. And so they pay for your travel and everything like that. Yeah, they paid for travel. It was a nonprofit. So That's they took care of all the travel, the lodging, the equipment. We were getting sponsorships uh, or whatnot. So uh, throughout this time, um, we had a, a player, Todd Reed, who was a um, uh, a uh, Desert Storm veteran who was missing a leg at the foot. It's called a Symes amputee. And he was a police officer out in Arizona. And I was like, man, he could do it. Like, you still be a cop. And I started asking questions for the first couple of years and, you know, kind of downing myself that I would be able to you know, physically be able to, to take the, the job on, the role on. And, um, and I started meeting so many law enforcement officers throughout the country because we were playing in, you know, these tournaments. And um, the biggest supporters there were veter veterans, military, first responders, the EMTs, you know. Um, yeah. So now I was like, man, I want to do this. I, I got to do this. And I started making more of a, a dream or a goal. And, um, you know, 2015 came around and we had a kids amputee camp um, that the softball basic, the softball team created um, because we were running into these kids all over the country and we wanted to give them a platform. We wanted to give them somewhere to call home and, and meet other amputee kids. And basically the mission statement was life without limbs is limitless. So we wanted these kids to know that there are no limitations to what they want to yeah. do. And unlike the military, there was not many different things going on for these kids at home that would allow them to see that there is a bigger picture. Um, so now we're traveling and, and, and now we have this big kids camp and um, the kids were like asking me like, Hey, coach Matt, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'm like, well, I'm kind of already grown up, you know? Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to find another career path and I want to be a cop yeah. and like, well, what are you waiting for? You know? So these kids were like that driving factor, you know, they're like, what are you waiting for? And I wanted to be that role model, um, for these kids and basically show them that anything is possible. And that especially yeah. today's world with the fact of engineering and, uh, all the prosthetic and the science and the, and the medicine that's out there. They're basically making life as typical. I don't like to use the word normal as much anymore, but yeah. as typical as possible to, to the human the human person. Um, so now I take the, the the written exam for my police department here in New York. And um, and I just kind of went in with you choose. What made you choose to go to New York? So I, when I was playing on the softball team, um, I, I met a girl and uh, kind of did that whole typical Marine thing, you know, <laughs> got out of the military Thought I fell in love. You know, I moved down to Florida to go to school. 
Um, and we ended up uh, getting pregnant with our daughter. And uh, and she, her being from New York, we ended up moving closer to home for her, uh, for her parents to have that family support system, um, you know, and uh, unfortunately it didn't work out between her and I, but we had this beautiful little girl and um, and I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to be near her. Uh, so I was working here and, and you know, playing a role in, in being a father and going to school, going to work and trying to find it is what I was going to do. Um, you know, so in the meantime, I was like, you know what, why not try the police department here in New York rather than back at home in Georgia? Um, so I started the, the civil service process because here you have to take a written exam and pass yeah. that written exam and score a good enough score. And then there's obviously other preliminary things like uh, background checks and uh, psych evaluation, medical evaluations, polygraph. Um, so I started the whole process and um, it was that was definitely an adventure because they, nobody had ever heard of it. You know, I was doing all this again, back to Google, like double amputee police officers and I was finding a couple of guys that got hurt on the job and stayed on as light duty or something, but yeah, uh, nobody who went through the whole process of the double amputee. And, um, and now I was super intrigued and I was like, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure out a way to get this done. And so of course I had all my papers, you know, signed by the VA and all my doctors yeah. saying, Hey, I was, uh, in physical fit to do the job and to basically proceed on with uh, the police officer's duties a day. And, um, and so one day I get a call and I'm, I'm on my way home with my boss. Cause my boss was, uh, was, was my partner and yeah. uh and it was the suffolk county police department and they said hey uh do you still want to be a cop and i said yeah and they're like all right you start monday and i was like, <laughs> I was like well i got so much for two weeks notice right That's so awesome, uh, now i'm stoked i'm like oh my god i gotta get my uniforms ready i gotta get this done i gotta go here i gotta go there and of course everything's super organized um so they had everything lined up and yeah. i show up the first day like the same way i did in the marine corps not knowing what to expect and uh and that was definitely an interesting yeah. six months did, so was that, did you guys have like a six month OJT or how does it work for the training for you guys? Uh, it is, it is on the job training. Um, to, th you mean through the post 11 GI bill and all that stuff? Well, like for, for, um, being a police officer there, cause every state's different here. Every here state's in different. Minnesota, you have to have, uh, the ASVAB, you have to pass the ASVAB score, which is like the test to become a, a so, peace officer. Military. Here. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was, it's for, it's for every, or not the ASVAB. Why the fuck am I saying ASVAB? It's the, uh. Mm -hmm. Uh, what the hell's the word I'm thinking of? Either way, well, you're so there, there, there's there's a, a test you have to take before you can be a cop here in Minnesota. It's the post test. I don't know why. Okay. I, I yeah, I mean for ASVAB. us, for for well, the ASVAB is the one to get into the military, but yeah. um, the uh, the test here is through civil service, so you have to take okay. a, a written exam, and then um, and then you have a six month academy. So for us, you know, we go through a, an academy, and that's where you learn, you know, the penal law, the traffic uh, vehicle traffic law, and you learn. Um, you know, obviously real, real based, you know, uh, reality training and, yeah. uh, you're doing the, the EVOC, which is the emergency vehicle operating course and that's uh, the fun, range right? <laughs> you're doing all that stuff, you know, to learn how to yeah. be a police officer. So, yeah, I mean, essentially it is on the job training. Um, yeah. but it's, it's a very intense course, you know, it's a, an intense Academy and, uh, and through the whole Academy, I was in the military class. So I had so many veterans out of 82 of us, I think like 56 or something like that were veterans. Um, oh, so I had a lot of brothers, man. I had a lot of my Good. brothers that served, um, here with me and pushing me and like, obviously, uh, as surprised as I was that I was here. Um, and so of course they were finding motivation to help me out and get through it. But, um, you know, I go through the six months course and, uh, my classmates somehow voted me in as class president. So that kind of gave me a bigger role, uh, <laughs> than just being, you know, another recruit. Um, and it was amazing, you know, being able to serve them and help the class to achieve whatever it is that we were looking for. Um, and when we graduate, I had met uh, General Neller, uh, who was uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time when uh, when I was going through the police academy at an Army Navy football game. And uh, and he gave me a challenge coin. He said, if you don't graduate the academy, I want my fucking coin back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, I love that. <laughs> so, so now I told him I kept in touch with him and his secretary. And I said, you know, this is uh, Lance Corporal Matias Ferreira. And I was going through police academy. And, uh, you know, General Neller told me to keep him in touch and whatnot. And they said two Marines over to my graduation to read out this proclamation it was really cool. Um, basically just saying congratulations on, you know, continue to represent the Marine Corps. And uh, I was super honored, obviously, to, to be wearing a different uniform and representing the Marine Corps uh, and everything that I do. And, uh, and, you know, then I was assigned to patrol. I was a patrolman, you know, out patrolling the streets just like anybody else. Yeah. And, you know, that was a, a, a and that was 2016, you said, right? I graduated in 2017. Yeah, I graduated the academy, the, the six months uh, of academy uh, in, in uh, March of 2017.
dude, that is so cool, man. You're you're literally paving the way for any kind of amputee who wants to, you know, fulfill any dream, you know, because being in law enforcement, it's an extremely physical job. You have to be able to perform. You have to be able to chase motherfuckers around too. So, like, <laughs> you know, the fact that you know you're doing it as a as a double amputee, that's that's amazing, dude. I I love hearing stories like this because it's four years. Uh, four years later, I have a I actually have a fellow Marine who I uh, who I play on the softball team. Uh, Zach Brizenio, he just graduated as the second double amputee uh, police oh, officer please. in the country in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and he kind of held in. Uh, he told me he was thinking about doing it. And I was like, "What are you waiting for?" Mm-hmm. And um, and I was like, "Dude, you better call me. Let me know what you're doing, what you're going through." And their their academy actually reached out to my academy uh, to see if there were any type of um, uh, accommodations or something like that. My academy was like, "No, we didn't really give him anything. He kind of did what he had to do." So uh, they were like, "Yeah, that's kind of what we were looking for." Um, and I knew Zach could do it, you know, and. Sure enough, he calls me like two months ago and he graduates and his buddies are in the locker room like, hey, dude, you, we saw you on the news. And uh, I was super stoked for him and, you know, kind of uh, made me super proud to not only represent the Marine Corps, but my department. And now knowing there's another double amputee out there and I'm sure there's vet- many different veterans or other um, amputees out there doing the job. Um, yeah. And after I got the social media platform, I had so many people reach out to me to let me know, like, Hey man, I'm a I'm an army amputee, and and uh, I think it was Missouri, and I'm a single below the knee in Cal- uh, California. I'm in, you know, uh, I think there was a guy I met in Minnesota who's a, a single below the knee. So it's out there, you know, it's out there. But what you're doing with these podcasts and this platform that you're putting out on um, these stories is where really people are like, hey man, like let me reach out to this guy. This is who I am, and um, I'm not just talking about the United States either. I've had people hit me up from Australia. Um, I had a guy from South Africa, uh, Brazil. Uh, a guy from my hometown in Uruguay reached out to me saying he's an amputee and, you know, this is who I am and this is my story. And it was just really cool to be able to uh, connect with these people, you know. So I think that what you're doing is also an awesome, awesome, awesome deed um, because it helps people like me, you know, get my story out and see if anybody else is out there that that wants to do this and kind of have that last kick in the ass, you know, to like, so we're yeah. waiting on, you know. For sure, man. And, you know, on top of that, you know, it's like we we have – this nonprofit started off as like, I initially was just going to use it as like a travel blog. I wasn't, it wasn't a 501c3. I was just going to sell merchandise and I was going to travel and blog about it to try to inspire veterans to start traveling. But like literally my first trip that I did, I climbed Eagle mountain in Northern Minnesota, but I took a bunch of veterans with me and I realized how beneficial it was. I was like, I can't do this alone. And so I was like, I need to figure out how I can take veterans with me. And so I looked into it and I'm like, I'm going to, start a nonprofit and everyone's like you don't know what the fuck you're doing like, you can't start a nonprofit. <laughs> and literally within like four months i figured out and i went to youtube university and you know now i got a nationwide nonprofit. so that's awesome um, something i want to offer you um if you're down uh august 14th we're actually flying to colorado uh, we're we're driving because i got a couple guys coming uh but we're going to uh um Colorado Springs, Denver, and then we're actually climbing Mount Massive, which is the second highest mountain peak in the in the Rockies. So that's if crazy. You're interested, I will fly you out to Colorado to actually come climb with us. We're gonna be there Wednesday the eleventh. Um, we're training jujitsu. We're going to this place called Mattersville. It's a wolf sanctuary over in uh, Colorado, but it's also a homeless veterans shelter, which is it's fucking awesome. awesome. Very cool. Uh, we're training. We're, we're training jujitsu at Zenith, and then Team Chaotic Combat Sports, and then we're heading up to Leadville which is uh it's a town that's like at 10,000 feet so you get a little acclimated and then the next day at like 4 a.m i think uh we're gonna go climb massive it's like uh i got pulled up here on all trails uh let's see here really um, cool man really it's, cool uh 14 i think it's 14,489 feet um so it's <laughs> a seven mile hike uh it's only 3,898 feet in elevation only so. Three thousand eight hundred. Yeah, only. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you're interested, um, give it a thought. And uh, where's next adventure? Will fly you out because we're flying. I really out appreciate fly- that. I have guys uh, to climb this mountain with us, so um, I will absolutely.
Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm not sure what happened. We got disconnected. My internet. Just shut off. God damn it. Oh. All right, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yep. This is man, I gotta fucking I gotta hardwire my internet. I can't do this <laughs> Wi Fi shit anymore. Yeah, you gotta uh, do the hardwire. Like, last year, um, we had uh, my buddy Jamie Murphy. His a buddy is hit of his killed himself not too long before, and uh, on Memorial Day he wanted to do the Murph challenge, and so he wanted to use it to raise funds and donate the money. So he did that, and we raised like I think we raised just under like two k. And he's an asshole because he challenged me to do the Murph challenge with him. So I had to do the Murph challenge, which sucked. Um, but we knocked it out. And uh, because he raised that money for us, I'm like, you know what? Why don't I fly you to Colorado? And so right now we're doing a uh, uh, we're doing a uh, a lottery. So the first four people to raise a thousand dollars get to go all expenses paid. Um, but we awesome. have one slot. We have one slot available um, for whoever I really want to fly out. So, I mean, the slot's yours if you want it, man. It'd be, uh, be really cool to actually hang out with you for a few days and um, get you up a mountain. That'd be cool, man. I haven't climbed any mountains yet, so definitely be a first. <laughs> hey, there you go, dude. Um, just uh, give it a thought, man. Uh, August 11th, and then we're flying back out on the 15th. So um, the offer's on the table, man. It'd be cool to see if you can uh, get your ass up that mountain. You can graduate from police academy and be a cop and then you can climb a mountain. <laughs> Hey, man, just catch me if I fall backwards, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk to you about, how did you get into jiu-jitsu? What, what pushed you that way? Was it being a law enforcement officer or what? So we have a pretty extensive DT program, which is defensive tactics here. And, um, and in the Marine Corps, we do what's called MIGMAP, which is mixed Marine Corps combat arms. Uh, yeah. You know, and basically I, I got into it a little bit and I liked it and, um, just like any typical Marine grunt, you know, I like to get, get dirty and roll around. We used to do bull in a circle, you know, so we put back to back, turn yeah. around and now we're all fighting and wrestling the and stuff. Force. They didn't let us do that. It was too. Dangerous. Hey man, it's all right. Listen, <laughs> you're, you're not in the air force right now. Are you, we could, we could, we could fly you out to New York and I could show you a little something. Um, Hell yeah, man, I'm down. It's awesome. So really the camaraderie, man, I, I, I had an idea yeah. that it would be really cool to, to get into a gym. Um, and actually the owner of my gym, it's a monster, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Mixed Martial Arts, uh, the guy is ranked like number five in the world. Um, not to mention, he's also a police officer. His name's Derek Manji. And um, nice. Derek hit me up and was like, hey, man, you know, being a police officer, you should definitely have been training. And, you know, you've been able to do so much cool shit. Like, why don't we get you down here and start training? And um, and so now I go down to the gym and I check it out. I meet some of the people and I loved it, man. I, I was frightened. I, I saw these guys rolling for the first time. Some were standing, some were kneeling. And I was like, how am I going to do it? Am I going to take my legs off? Am I going to keep them on? Um, so a lot of ego drive at the time. You know, yeah. I, I didn't know really how to get started. That's that's really it. I didn't really know how to get started. I was like, these guys are purple, brown, black belts. Like, what what am I doing here? And um, and so how long you been training? I'm, I'm almost been a year now. I've, I just oh, hit okay. a year, I, probably like a week. I just hit a year a week ago. So now, again, I wasn't really nervous about like the putting my hands on people. It was more so like, how do I start? And so now I yep. go down there and everybody made me feel at home. We train with a lot of uh, law enforcement officers, the Leos that train. Uh, we train with a lot of veterans. There's a lot of Marines there, as you can probably imagine. And so I felt right at home the first day, man. I, I go in there. They gave me a gi. They gave me my white belt. Um, and and I just, they're like, hey, man, Tuesdays, Thursdays, you're here. Yes or yes. And I was like, all right, I'm here Tuesdays and Thursdays. So for the last year, I've been coming Tuesday, Thursday. Sometimes I go Friday. Sometimes I go Sundays, too. Yeah. You know, so I can go from two to four days. Um, and the more I got involved in it, not only was it humbling um, in, a, in a body perspective, learning my body again and the flexibility yeah. and the strength that here I am bench pressing 315, 355, getting my one rep max. It didn't matter, man. I was getting I was getting tied up and, and choked out yeah. by guys that are like 130 pounds. Um, <laughs> and so for me, I, that was the eye opener. I was like, man, as a yeah. police officer, as, as a law enforcement officer this is my life. You know, if I can't go to my gun for whatever reason in a situation where it's deadly physical force or something happens, um, you know, I need to be able to train. I, I need to be able to defend myself and, and go home at the end of the day. So I started taking it more seriously. And again, I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the art. I fell in love with the fact that there are a, a bunch of veterans from my, or, and there are people that I've seen that are uh, out there rolling around in jujitsu. So I'm definitely nowhere by far yeah. the first, but I'm another guy that just joined 
you know, a whole family of, of amputees, you know, the cult doing do, do, do jujitsu, you know, for, for, for any you, type of purpose. Have you heard of, uh, have you heard of Joey Bozik from uh, We Defy Foundation? Uh, yes, I have. I just spoke to, okay. to them not too long ago on, on Instagram, nice. We Defy Foundation. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So um, I'm a We, we Defy ambassador. Um, it's, I, I teamed up with them fairly quickly once I started Warriors Next Adventure because I was going to incorporate jujitsu into my nonprofit because it is extremely healing and I want veterans to train jujitsu. Um, and then when I decided to do the PTSD versus jujitsu documentary, um, and the tour and everything, it, it just seemed like a no brainer to, to, uh, partner with these guys. And so we're actually going down to, uh, um, combat base, Texas, where Shabaro is and, uh, Joey Bozik. So we're going to do, uh, uh, jujitsu roll with those guys but i was gonna ask what do you do you guys normally train on memorial day or is the gym closed That's no i mean that... i feel like we've all trained uh on memorial day and, and a lot of the mm-hmm. times like you know valentine's day all these holidays uh we just try to make it a theme you know so if it's memorial day we'll we'll you know honor honor those who have fallen or veterans day we're honoring our veterans valentine's day like you know uh, hugs and cut, hugs and cuddles, or whatever it is, you know, our bars oh, me, and cuddles. Me and my girlfriend went to the gym on Valentine's Day. We were choking each other out. Um, That's it, man. No, I we're, rolled... we're actually we're we're climbing a mountain. Um, have you heard of uh, Mount Washington? I think it's Connecticut. Mount Washington. Right? I have not. So it's it's the highest peak in Connecticut, I believe. Um, so on my tour, we're actually going to be there on Sunday the thirtieth, and then the thirty first. We're actually looking what the hell we're going to do on Memorial Day. So we were either going to go to Boston or New York or something. But, I mean, if your coach wants to do a jiu-jitsu seminar for the tour on Memorial Day at Monster, that'd be fucking sweet. Absolutely, man. Definitely shoot me a message uh, on so I can just make sure that I get the dates down and stuff, and we'll definitely talk to him. Okay, yeah, that'd be cool. Because then uh, I, I we, we're trying to figure out what the hell to do because we're going to be on the East Coast over in the Boston area, and we're like, we don't know what the hell to do on Memorial Day over in that area. So we're Absolutely, trying to figure man. out what the hell we're going to do for that part of the tour because the day after that we're
Sorry, guys. Uh, we kept having some uh, really bad internet issues, and uh, we had to cut it short. Um, I'm actually on my phone right now. Um, we're going to be on again real soon. Um, thanks again for Mateus for coming on. Uh, it was a great podcast. Again, check out his uh, Instagram, uh, Mateus Ferreira. Uh, also, check out Warriors Next Adventure online. Um, apparently, I need to update my internet services, so that will be something that will be happening fairly soon. Um, if you want to support the GoFundMe for the uh, PTSD vs. Jiu-Jitsu documentary, um, that is starting April 21st. All of the dates are on the GoFundMe. It's actually in the description here. Click on that. Go check it out. If you want to support us, it's going to help us get around the country. Um, we have 37 different Jiu-Jitsu gyms. Sounds like we might have just hooked up another one at Monster. So thank you guys for uh, for listening in. Sorry about all the internet connection issues. That's, it's really annoying, so that won't happen again, I promise. Thanks, guys. Thanks again for all your support. Love you guys.